Welcome to The Sacramentalist, a podcast where the ancient Christian faith is brought to bear on issues prevalent in modern culture. We're your hosts. I'm Father Creighton McElveen. And I'm Father Wesley Walker. And today we have Archbishop Mark Haverland of the ACC on with us to talk about why Mary matters. Archbishop Haverland has a PhD from Duke, and he has been a guest on this podcast before, and we're very excited to have you on again. Archbishop, how are you doing? Thank you. I'm, I'm doing well. No complaints. That's Not yet, good. anyways. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. We, I, was, I was joking with, with you all before I had looked at your Wikipedia, and it actually mentions that you were on the podcast last time uh, to talk about universalism. So um, you never know where this is going to take you, I guess. We'll see what gets added this time. Yeah. <laughs> Depends who's watching. That's right. Yeah, we've got, I mean, who knows? I'm not quite sure what our YouTube uh, audience is like because we have the audio audience. We have the, you know, kind of people who have been with us for a while, but uh, YouTube reaches different people. So this may be their first experience. Uh, and, you know, they're excited to see you, Archbishop. <laughs> Thank you. Well, they can do a freeze frame and put it on their dartboard. <laughs> well, today we want to talk about, um, I think it's a pithy little uh, catchphrase, though, but why Mary matters. Um, we've had a number of questions. This is an, uh, a particular topic that comes up a lot on our Discord. Um, viewers, listeners, if you are interested in that, remember you can join uh, our Discord by becoming a uh, Patreon and joining the Communion of Patreon Saints. Um, but we we do get a lot of questions about this, and so I think just as a, a an introduction, um, could you sort of give us a little, you know, elevator pitch why Mary matters? Uh, my my predecessor, uh, Brother John Charles Vockler. Uh, used to say, and there's a certain kind of Protestant who seems to think our Lord's Blessed Mother is a deceased Roman Catholic lady, uh, <laughs> which I, th I think is a great line. And there are probably some Roman Catholics who also believe she's a deceased Roman Catholic lady. Um, but I don't think that's a really a sound um, position, uh, either from a, a Protestant or a Roman Catholic perspective. So I, I think that idea is wrong. And um, I was jotting down some things yesterday as I prepared for this. <laughs> and I, I came up with um, some doctrinal reasons why, why Mary matters or why it's wrong to think that she doesn't matter. And um, some biblical matter, biblical reasons. And of course the two are, are related. Uh, and then uh, by way of um, extension from those, uh, there are reasons why it seems to me logical and important for Christians to view Mary as a representative and model for the Christian and for the church. Um, and so I have those three broad categories of, of reasons. And uh, they support each other, I think, and are coherent with each other, uh, and together are, I think, fairly, fairly strong. Um, so that's that's the overview. And then, of course, we'd have to talk about what those various reasons are, at least from my point of view, which we can do. Um, but I think they're doctrinal, biblical, and um, of pastoral and devotional reasons for thinking that Mary does matter. I think that's, yeah, I, I think whenever we approach this particular issue, those are sort of the three places that we should come from, right? We should sort of say there's a doctrinal reason, there's biblical, scriptural reason. You can maybe include in there the historical to kind of church traditional reason. Um, and then there's also that sort of devotional, um, pastoral, supernatural sort of 
experience uh, as a reason. Um, one of one of our listeners, uh, Jeff, asked a question, and I think it can kind of take us down this uh, track. He said, "What what must Anglicans believe, um, and what should be Anglican faith and practice ideally?" So I think some of our listeners are gonna, you know, they come from all over the map in terms of um, ecclesial affiliation, and we have Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Anglicans, non-Anglicans. Um, but from sort of our vantage point, our perspective, uh, what must Anglicans believe? And then how does that sort of work itself out in practice? Right. Um, I, I would, I would note, uh, by way of preliminary, uh, a preliminary to answering that, that historically, I think there's a, a difference in approach, a theological approach. Uh, the difference between Roman Catholics on the one hand and Anglicans on the other. Roman Catholics have tended to emphasize the specific difference which distinguishes their position from others. Uh, so, for instance, in terms of ecclesiology, the specific difference is the Petrine office, or even the, the particulars of their understanding of the papacy that distinguish them from a Eastern Orthodox view that might accept the primacy of honor, but not the Vatican I uh, dogmas of infallibility and universal ordinary jurisdiction. Uh, and then in terms of Marian uh, doctrine, uh, if, you, if you take that approach, the most important thing from their point of view would tend to be the uh, immaculate conception and the assumption as the last uh, doctrines um, dogmatize. And you might even find a few Roman Catholics who would think that the idea of Mary as the co-mediatrix of all grace is really where, it, where it's at. And uh, that, that, that helps separate the uh, good guys from the bad guys. Um, Anglicans, instead of that emphasis on the specific difference would tend to historically emphasize the, uh, the common base of belief. So it's uh, more a pyramid uh, in which uh, the, the largest area of agreement at the base is shared and that that really is the, the, the most important thing upon which everything else rests and that the, the higher you, up you go towards things that are more uh, distinctive, uh, in some ways, the less important. Uh, not to say unimportant, but, but less important. So in, in terms of Marian doctrine, the, the two um, conciliar uh, dogmas, I think, uh, you know, we can talk about perpetual virginity later, but the, the two things that most uh, Christians would say are are a creedal and conciliar uh, beliefs are the perpetual uh, the uh, the uh, virginal conception of our Lord, <laughs> and then the uh, in, in virtue of the unity of our Lord's person, the uh, teaching of the Third Council that Mary is the the Theotokos, the, the God bearer. Um, so those those two things I think are are basic, small o orthodox, fetal Christian essentials. Um, so, and they're the two most important things. So it, it's sort of a shame if we disagree about um, uh, things that are less important. Again, not unimportant, but less important, and neglect uh, the shared body of belief that uh, is, is more fundamental. Um, so I'd, I'd begin by saying that. And then the idea that, um, or the question, um, what must Anglicans believe? Um, well, it, I would say, again, there's a hierarchy of beliefs. And uh, I think that if you were in the continuing church, um, it would be, uh, there would be things that you probably shouldn't publicly reject anyway, recognize that 
these are believed by by the central tradition of the church by most Christians and um, even if you don't understand them or think they're particularly important you probably shouldn't reject them and I think that would include the the idea of um, the appro- the appropriateness or at least permissibility of uh, invoking Mary's prayers so uh, Mar- Mary in intercession and um, and probably the, the perpetual virginity uh, would be in, in that category of things that are pretty important and generally uh, agreed upon. Um, <clears throat> and then um, there would be things where I would say you've gone too far, such as the uh, mediatrix of all, of all grace, which is an idea that might be patient of orthodox interpretation with a whole lot of work. Uh, you know, in, in a sense, do I help mediate grace because I pray for you? Well, maybe, but I don't think we would say that. Um, and then there, the, um, the, the two um, uh, dogmas uh, dogmatized by Rome in the 19th and 20th century, um, I think, are, are more problematic. So they're somewhere in between uh, definitely gone too far and uh, generally believed um, that Mary is in some sense sinless, um, that God has uh, suppressed sin in her. Um, most Orthodox Christians would believe, Eastern Orthodox Christians would believe, that Mary's in heavenly glory, most Christians would believe. But the kind of um, specification in detail in the Roman dogmas, um, just, well, it says a whole lot that we really just can't know. And, um, and particularly the, uh, the uh, Immaculate Conception has a whole lot of very weighty medieval um, um, uh, disbelief. Uh, you know, when you've got Thomas Aquinas saying no, um, then it, it's hard to see this as a um, dogma that's been universally believed, which uh, is what Rome, Rome says, um, universally believed by the, by the church, by the Catholic church, as I understand it. So I would say there's a hierarchy of beliefs, and uh, Anglicans certainly need to believe the, uh, the uh, virginal conception of our Lord and the Theotokos. And um, I think probably so far as we aspire to be part of the central tradition of the church, um, need to uh, affirm or should affirm, can affirm the uh, intercession of Mary um, and the perpetual virginity. But I wouldn't dogmatize uh, the perpetual virginity because I don't think it can be proven from scripture. So it, it can be a, a Devout belief, or even a doctrine, but not a necessary or essential doctrine. So there's where there's where I got in trouble. Um, people said, "Oh, Haverland says the perpetual virginity is merely a, a pious opinion," as if that meant, um, oh, you know, probably not true, and um, just a theory some people have. But a pious opinion is a term of art, and it's you know, it says it's consistent with the whole of the Christian faith. It's pious, it's devout, it's godly, doesn't contradict anything essential. But Anglicans would just say, but we can't prove it from scripture. So um, it has at least a lesser authority than those two necessary dogmas. So that's, that, that's my, would be my attempt. Um, I, I've also always as a pastor, when we were, when dealing with Protestant converts, so I just, you know, I have trouble with asking the saints to pray for me, say, well, don't, you know, they'll pray for you anyway, um, and when it's time for you to, uh, to, to uh, believe that and to do, do that, you will, so don't worry about it, don't worry about it for now. I, I always tell people there are thousands of devotions to choose from, so pick Pick yeah. one that works for you and don't don't worry about that too much. Yeah, I think that's yeah. that's sound advice. On that topic, we have another uh, listener named Father Mac who who was curious why 
why it is that from a very early point, Christians have sought the Blessed Virgin's aid and look to her more as a friend and an intercessor than as a sort of static example for imitation. Hmm. Well, I suppose you could say it's it's embedded there in um, in John two in the the story of Canaan, the first miracle which our Lord wrought in Cana of Galilee, um, in which the King James translation really um, makes it sound as if there's a little opposition between our Lord and his mother, um, sort of as if our Lord says to his mother, "Well, you know." Don't bother me. But when in the, the, the pronouns are, are parallel, what, he's, what he really says is, what is that to thee and me? So that's their problem. That's not our problem. Um, but then she does ask him to do something, and he does it. So we have, we have that um, idea uh, already, I think, implicit in in. That the first miracle in John, um, and then that leads into a whole Joanine um, uh, uh, development, I think, around the figure of the woman, as as Mary is called, of course, in John, uh, either Mary or the mother of our Lord, mother of the Lord, <coughs> um, and uh, that begins at Canaan, then it concludes at, at the crucifixion when uh, John, the beloved disciple, is entrusted to Mary's care and vice versa. So both Mary and the beloved disciples are in a way figures of the church. Um, so disciples entrusted to the care of Mary or to the maternal care of Mary, but also Mary entrusted to the care of of the uh, of, of uh, John, and uh, and then leading on into uh, Revelation twelve and the figure of the woman and the child uh, there, um, and you know Protestants would say, well, the woman's a figure for the church, and Roman Catholics would say she's, uh, the woman's a figure for Mary, but it's of course. A figure for both because Mary is a figure for the church, a figure of the church, and the church is Marian. So um, uh, anyway, I think I think you could say intercession um, of Mary begins with that example in um, in John two, and um, develops from there. But you also have to say that there are some pretty broad swaths of patristic literature in which. There's not a whole lot of concern about uh, Mary or the intercession of saints, which is why it seems to me not unsound to tell people who uh, are concerned about that it's it's not the it's not the essence of the faith. It's it's part of the inner practice of the life of the church. But um, if you're not there yet, don't worry about it. I think there's kind of something. Oh, sorry. Well, um, I think I think there's something interesting here too that while we see Our Lady um, sort of interceding on behalf of the the guests at the wedding of Cana, um, and you know you can you can theologize from that, and uh, I think plenty of theologians have done so, and the Church has sort of done that in a general sense. Um, but there's something I think interesting about that sort of intimacy that we see uh, between the Christian and Our Lady, uh, the intimacy that we see between our Lord and his mother, uh, the disciples, the sort of adopted sons of Our Lady. Uh, you know, we, we culturally, I think, understand that there is a, a very intimate relationship between, say, mothers and sons. Um, and that from a practical, personal, sort of experiential level, that that sort of relationship works itself out in uh, looking for help, yeah. looking for aid, seeking intercession. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have a great relationship with my father, and I go to him for things, but 
if something is really, really bad or there's some sort of comfort, you know, when I was a child, I needed to be comforted or assisted with something. My natural recourse was to my mother. I think a lot of people share that experience. Um, and I think it's an interesting point in the, in the life of the church, the Christians praying spiritual life, um, that from early times, you know, we, we do have the very early prayer, the Subtuum Presidium, um, where that prayer speaks of going to Our Lady uh, sort of under her protection, under her mantle. Um, and I, I think the church as a family, the church as um, this society, right, this sort of um, large family unit goes to the mother, goes to our lady in a very intimate way um and that that is sort of always pre uh, prevents a sort of a static kind of relationship where she's just sort of out there and you need to be like her she's good um and it sort of encourages this more sort of progressive active converting sort of reality where we're learning we're experiencing we're um being taught but it's the the mother to child teaching which is very dynamic um, and not particularly static. And I just think that's a interesting piece to the devotional puzzle in the history of the church that um, that natural recourse seems to be present in the church from a very early time. Right. Yeah, uh, it, it seems um, that, that it is something that, that would, would naturally, naturally develop. I suppose the, uh, the, the critical remarks someone make about that is uh, yeah so this is a kind of reimportation back into um <clears throat> israel's religion and and the gospel's religion <clears throat> of a fe of a feminine element <clears throat> um and a, a sort of a, um retrograde step um but but i don't think it's that i, I think it is natural and i, I think it's implicit in um in that john two story and i think it's also implicit in the, the structural the the whole structure of the old and the new testament and the um the nuptial imagery that is used to um, uh, present the relationship of god and his people af at least after some that's pretty much absent in the earliest Old Testament, where the sexualization of the divine is too close uh, in the Canaanite and surrounding cultures. Uh, but after that's been banished, then the nuptial imagery becomes very powerful. And um, that means um, that uh, Mary's position becomes important and something we have to fit into that. Of course, it also relates to the whole issue of, of the ordination of women and uh, our tr position, the, the traditional position on that issue. Um, so uh, that suggests to me that this, that the Mary is is more fundamental, as you say, than just a just a model, um, deceased Roman Catholic woman, or a a model for behavior. Yes. Um, uh, and and even more than just someone who prays for us, but uh, some somehow embedded in this whole structure of metaphor for thinking about the relationship of God and God's people. So kind of on that note, we we had another listener point out that in the East, they have a feast celebrating the the protecting veil of the Holy Theotokos. Mm -hmm. So he was wondering, how do we as Western Christians, specifically Anglican Western Christians, seek the protection of our most holy mother of God? Well, uh, the, there are prayers that, you know, we, we, we flee to your protection, uh, flee to the, thy protection and so forth. Um, and then also, I mean, the, the holy protecting veil was cast over Constantinople, as I recall, to protect the city from from uh, non-Christian <laughs> attackers, and uh, ultimately uh, uh, 
they they won. Um, so that's um, how our, our Lady's intercession is ultimately not a uh, inter yeah. I suppose it does involve um, our material and physical concerns because that's that's we're embedded in the world and incarnate in the world. But uh, Our Lady's intercession um, seems to me to kind of cover that. How how do we flee to her? Protection. Well, we flee to her protection by seeking her intercession, um, and understanding that it does have a, a special. It, it is in a special category. Uh, so we we honor the saints, but but Mary has uh, super julia, great honor, uh, greater honor than the other saints. Um, so I, I don't know if that's would, would satisfy the the Eastern Orthodox question. But um, it seems to me if we are, if we're uh, saying the Hail Mary or saying the Rosary or saying the Marian antiphons uh, and the, the traditional uh, Marian prayers, then, um, then we are fleeing to Mary's uh, help. I like the idea of, of um... I mean, this sort of is true, I think, in the spiritual life in general, right? When we say we need protection, help, assistance, um, and maybe naturally we sort of think in material terms, but often our that help, that aid, that protection may in fact be supernatural, spiritual help, aid, protection. Um, so we may we may not be the most comfortable in in physical terms, but it's for the good of our soul. Um, leading to our perfection, our salvation, and the idea of of sort of sitting in the school of Mary, of sort of of her saying, "Hello, child. Would you like to be like my son? Let me let me bring you into what it means to live a life of grace by showing you my son." Like uh, every mother um, acts for the good and perfection of her child if she's a good mother. Um, mm -hmm. Which is ultimately, in the case of Our Lady, for our salvation, right? She's acting for us to know Christ better, right? Um, which is sort of the ultimate aid, assistance, protection. Um, but that that may mean um, something more nuanced and complex than uh, saving our home from a fire or the city of Con Constantinople. <laughs> Just as healing ultimately is, we're all going to die. So all the prayers for healing, you could say, and ultimately fail. But of course, we're praying for healing unto life eternal, ultimately. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's the ultimate goal. Um, there, there is also, um, and I think this figures in in reflection about Mary. There's uh, the importance of Mary's silence and her pondering she kept all these things in her heart <clears throat> so this idea of pondering and chewing over the uh, what what has happened and reflecting on it and meditating it upon it i think that's a uh, that's a model for us and something we're not particularly inclined to in our day we want to be activists, <laughs> but uh, being willing just to watch. Um, and I think about the, uh, the, the finding in the temple. Um, I mean, by age 12, all that stuff from the first 40 days, uh, that's, that's a long time in the past. And, and by 12, he's just their little boy. And um, so, all that the sense of who he is had to be renewed and i think that turns up then on the not frequent but occasional um points later in the gospels when mary turns up uh, as in today's gospel um in the anglican missal um your, your mother and brothers are out there waiting for you um but uh, you know her, just her observing and watching, and and gradually growing into what she was told at the very beginning. Um, 
is, uh, I think, significant. The, another part, too, about Marian devotion, which uh, I think is important, uh, also is the poetry and hymnody. Um, and for Anglicans, that's particularly important. Um, you can't really understand what Anglicans um, think about Mary <clears throat> without looking at Roland Palmer's um, singing Mary pure and lowly or George Herbert's, uh, I'm sorry, um, Thomas Ken's wonderful poem, Her Virgin Eyes, Saw God Incarnate Born. Um, all of that's, some, someone said, people, Christians will sing things they wouldn't say. And uh, Anglicans will, will sing things about Mary that they maybe wouldn't say about Mary. But they do sing them. and They enjoy singing them. And so that's, that's a, an important thing. And maybe, um, I'm, I'm sure there, you know, there are, of course, are Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic hymns too. But the Anglicans are actually usually better uh, poetry and, uh, and maybe better theology too. In the case of Ken, I'm reminded of a time when I attended an Anglican church where I know most of them did not have a very high Mariology, but the choir did sing Ave Maria. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry, I, was, I was got a kick out of it. Uh, when when Archbishop Lewis was uh, elected um, Metropolitan, I was a um, I was a canonical advisor to the College of Bishops. So a, a priest was asked to lead the clergy and laity in the rosary while the bishops met. And at one point I was called out <clears throat> to give the bishops some advice. And I went into the big hallway of, a, of the hotel where a number of people were smoking, um, absented themselves from uh, part of the rosary. Uh, it did go on to all 30 decades I mean, it was a lot of rosary but a, a priest saw me and uh, we, we both seen uh, peg cosby who was um, a delightful lady a former uh, executive with a fortune 500 company and a former oss i think spy and uh, but anyway a remarkable lady but from from ireland and uh, we both saw her saying the rosary this priest said our blessed mother's hearing from a whole lot of people she hasn't heard from in a long time. And <laughs> I think that was, that was true. So people will, people will go along with the flow. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think, um, one of the things you were talking about there made me think of all the paintings of the Annunciation where she has her hand in a book she's reading and she's been interrupted by Gabriel. Um, certainly the idea of study is very important to her meditation, the contemplative life. Um, and so we had one we had one listener, Austin, um, who had a lot of great questions. And I don't think we can fit all of these, all of his questions in this particular episode. So we'll have to have you back sometime to to maybe pick up this conversation later. But but he asks, um, what role does Mary's knowledge, that is her knowing of the good, play in her moral psychology or moral reasoning? That is her choosing to do the good, given her exalted status. Um, he kind of goes on to say, if Mary is, is the exemplar of the greatest human virtues, what does this imply about the relationship between knowledge and virtue in general? Hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting and tough question. Um, the, uh, the the psychology, well, Thomas's psychology is that um, the good is is uh, well. First, it's in the in the sense sense knowledge. Is, so it's first in the senses, and then it's in the intellect, and then the will uh, perceives it to be good and chooses it uh, under the aspect of good or desirable, and. Um, even when the intellect, even when the will chooses evil, it's choosing the choosing evil under the aspect of good. Um, there's some good being sought by the choice, even of evil. Um, so it's chosen. It's a lesser good, but it's still a good. Um, so the um, we would certainly say that um, virtue is not. Um, 
typically uh, correlated uh, with intellect um, in, in that we know the, the intelligence and virtue are, are not um, tracking each other closely all the time. We know very bright people who are very bad and people who are very simple, but full of virtue and goodness. Um, so you could be fully good, um, saintly, um, and uh, be, be less uh, intelligent um, than others who are not nearly as saintly. Um, so how that, how that, those ideas would fit um, with Our Lady, um, I'm not sure. Are we, we, do we want to think of her as being preeminently intelligent? Um, I don't know. Um, is she, is she uh, perfectly, perfectly good in, and, and very simple? Uh, perhaps. Um, that probably uh, runs afoul of some of the uh, images in the, in the, in the Marian litany, you know, mirror of virtue and, and uh, so forth. Um, but I, I guess I would uh, say God, God probably chose a young, a young girl um, for some reason other than her intellect. It seems to, well, I guess it depends. I mean, we're about to talk about the Immaculate Conception and her relationship with original sin or, or not. But I mean, even if she was born without original sin, my, my understanding, at least from Thomas and from some of the medievals, is that their idea would have been um, that, that ignorance is the inability to drink in truth without mixing in error. So even if she doesn't have that kind of ignorance, it doesn't necessarily mean she is an intellectual per se, but it does mean that her perception of truth will be clearer, more refined than the usual person's. Yeah, so, uh, well, I mean, sin, again, to go back to this uh, psychology of, of, uh, of choice, we choose what well, we choose under the aspect of good, but we cho often choose a lesser good. And from one point of view, that's just, it's not only bad, it's also stupid. Um, if, I, if I choose to sin, I'm choosing that, which is not, not as good for me as uh, choosing the good would be. But we do it all the time. So um, Mary then, um, yeah, I mean, Mary, is, Mary does say, how can this be? I know that I, because I know not a man. Well, she's, you know, there's, there's, um, there's intellect at work there saying, how can this be? I don't understand. <laughs> um, and then there is also the, uh, the, the implicit faith and trust in the uh, divine message or the divine call and the angelic message. So there is intellect at work and um, presumably growth in virtue will also clarify our intellect by making these um, uh, aversions of our intellect that allow us to sin, um, making those harder um so yeah the, all that that line of argument uh, or of question is was interesting to me and i'm not sure i'd have to think more about it i just saw those questions uh two hours ago so. yeah that was my fault but also uh, just an excuse to maybe have you on for another episode so we can oh, add well, more to your you. wikipedia page <laughs> <laughs> So I think um, we could kind of now go down the avenue of talking about um, sort of the distinction between dogma and doctrine um, and sort of why as Anglicans, um, and I would, I mean, maybe caveat this and say uh, maybe most Anglicans or some Anglicans, um, there are plenty of Anglo-Catholics and 
Anglo papalists and things like that who would accept the particular dogmatizations uh, made by the Roman Catholic Church, but sort of as a general whole, uh, Anglicans don't. Um, so why would we not accept, say, the Immaculate Conception or the Assumption um, as a dogma, but then still affirm it as a position that we could hold? Right. Well, I think the uh, the, the distinction between essential doctrine or Nestor dogma um, and everything else for Anglicans rests in the ordination of Thomas or, or, or uh, assurance to the bishop that will teach nothing is necessary for salvation uh, except such as uh, may be concluded from scripture. Um, so uh, the uh, assumption can't be proven from scripture. If, 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 you, uh, if you're building uh, a biblical case for the assumption on the basis of Revelation 12, then I think you're, you're going too far because it's a highly allegorical and metaphorical chapter in a book that is uh, highly allegorical. I don't think you can build a very strong uh, uh, biblical case for the assumption. Um, and I think the first patris patristic evidence is, is in heretical literature, and it's pretty late. Um, so the assumption um, um, is one thing. If we talk about Mary's glorification, then that's another. So let me go back to my predecessor, Brother John Charles, who was at a uh, conference of Franciscans in Assisi, looking views of Our Lady, and uh, at, at everybody was very polite. And at the end, he said, an, an old Italian Monsignor stood up and said, very nice, very nice, very nice. What, what about the assumption? What about the assumption? And uh, John Charles said, well, I think it would be very difficult. I think it would be very difficult for you to find an Anglican who did not believe that Our Lady is with her son in heaven. But whether she got there by the express train or the local doesn't seem to us to be very important. And that got translated into Italian. He listened to the translation and then he applauded. He said, yeah, bravo, bravo, bravo. Very good, very good. Um, so the point being, the, the doctrinal essence of the assumption to say human nature can be taken up into, into the divine, into God, into, into heaven. And of course, our Lord ascends into heaven with his human nature, but he's God, you know. So he's going he's gonna to get to go. But the Mary also is, is glorified, um, is hopeful to us. So I think that to me is the, the doctrinal point of the assumption, and, um, and, and that's helpful. Um, but the details, I, I had a, a friend who said, I've, I've been shown Mary's tomb in Jerusalem, and I've been told, I've been shown Mary's tomb in Ephesus, and I've been told Mary doesn't have a tomb. So um, does, do I have to decide, you know? So could we talk a little bit about your kind of personal convictions on some of these things? Because obviously, as a bishop, you have to sort of uh, adhere to the kind of broadness of the Anglican tradition. You know, so these three dogmas uh, that, that Rome says are, are necessary, um, ever virginity and immaculate conception and assumption are to our people, something we can't really force on them. But but as far as your own personal piety, are, are these pious opinions that you hold, or do you kind of caveat some of them, or how do you how do you work all that out for yourself? Well, I use I use a confidior and that in and that's public and liturgical. Um, so I'm proclaiming through uh, worship of a belief. Um, 
So in that case, uh, Lexorandi statuit legem credendi, right? I'm uh, praying and that's establishing what I believe or showing what I believe. Um, I have known I have known Anglicans, including members of the ACC, who who uh, have qualms about the perpetual virginity, and I would not say this is um, um, something that should cause them to leave the church. I, I would tend to say I think it's something that time will time will show them. <laughs> um, so that easier one. Um, the Immaculate Conception, I, I um, have always celebrated of Our Lady's Conception. Our Lady was, was sinless, I, I believe. I, I think our Lord um, um, gave her such a measure of grace that there was no personal sin in her. Um, I, I don't think we can prove that from Scripture. So I think that that can't be a necessary doctrine that we would enforce on people. Um, <clears throat> so again, that's, um, and, and I celebrate Our Lady, the conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, not the Immaculate Conception, but um, that there's something more than the typical human conception uh, in terms of grace uh, seems to me likely. So I'm just trying to be a little bit vaguer and I, and I do note that several of the greatest schoolmen in the Middle Ages in the Western Church did not believe in the, the Immaculate Conception. So um, I don't think that can be a necessary doctrine, um, given the, the amount of dissent. Um, and then there's a little bit of disingenuousness to say, this has always been believed in the Church, when, well, not really. <laughs> um, then um, the assumption again, if we if we see this as Mary's glorification, her um, her entrance into heaven, um, her um, the, the 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 crowning of her life uh, of grace by God, uh, no problem um, that that it, that the, the precise relationship exactly happened to her body um, at, at the moment of her death. It's really, I think, more than we know. And again, Scripture's silent about it, <clears throat> so I don't think we can say this is a necessary dogma. But, you know, something that um, in a way that is true, liturgically commemorated, no, I think I think ultimately that's helpful because um, you know there there is I think I know many priests sort of kind of on one side or the other uh, about those particular issues, but they you know we can all sort of um, acknowledge and sort of affirm those positions or or sort of the the theology behind the positions without maybe having to push it to the to the point of um complete dogmatization um and so we can we can kind of understand those that way um now what are your thoughts um and sort of a similar way with like the idea of you know the kind of praying worshiping life of the church um related to marian doctrines um what are your thoughts on like consecration to the to our lady things like that uh well you know if, if it serves your devotions um fine was it c.s lewis who said if mary's a jewish mother then she really wants everybody to concentrate more on her child um than on herself um so there's something to that so i i think there's a and i think anglicans have a pretty healthy balance anglo-catholics anyway um i don't think marian i don't think anybody thinks mary's a goddess in amongst anglicans i don't think any uh, anglican devotion is um disproportionately marian um but i think for most anglo-catholics um 
Marian devotion is is uh, is important. Um, so there's a balance. That uh, we we just recently had our episode on the um, our sort of draft for the five best devotional uh, works, and I included Saint Louis de Montfort's book on uh, Our Lady and consecration to Our Lady. Um, but I wouldn't say sort of like what you're saying here is you know that's not something where I'm like everybody needs to go do that right now. Um, right, right. But I, I have felt personally great benefit from, again, sort of like sitting at the foot of Our Lady and, and sort of allowing that to, to sort of point me in the direction of her son. Um, that sort of um, willingness to sit at her feet and to contemplate and to sort of move in that sort of Marian direction towards Christ. Uh, so I, I think it's a good thing, um, but I wouldn't say it's a thing everybody has to do. Um, and it might turn some people off who are new to things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's cultural. I, I, I was given a Eastern Orthodox kind of book uh, once, and there were, one of the um, titles for Mary was Butter Mountain. Um, and, um, I guess if you're a hungry Siberian peasant, <laughs> Butter Mountain is a terribly comforting idea, but it doesn't do a lot for the typical American. Um, maybe it should, maybe it's a fault in us. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've noticed quite a lot of use of, uh, butter, especially in the South. <laughs> Well, Our Lady and, and, of Perpetual Blocked <laughs> Arteries. <laughs> or read, read Julia Child, where every recipe leads into butter enrichment near the end, or cream enrichment, or most likely both. <laughs> Fat is where it's at, in the uh, words of Steve Goodman. <laughs> So we had a, a great question from from a listener named Caden who um, who asks, and I, I think this is helpful. What's a good baseline Marian piety for a lay person, especially a lay person in the Anglican tradition? And obviously, there's going to be room for variation, especially working with a spiritual director or or a priest um, in terms of of developing one's own devotional life. But but what should what's kind of a, a common denominator that everyone can shoot for? Uh, I think the the Marian antiphons, um, at, uh, in conjunction with morning and evening prayer, would be uh, would be a good one. And you can even argue their prayer book, even if the text isn't, because the Latin prayer book says, "On uh, you may say an antiphona." So um, uh, maybe. Uh, making an effort to attend some of the major Marian feasts, uh, August 15th, uh, December 8th, um, and certainly the uh, Annunciation. I, I've always taught the Annunciation is a um, day of obligation. Uh, I think the Rosary is good um the the rosary one one nice thing about repetitive prayer is it's something that is um possible even when we're sick even when we're not feeling well um it, it does not require a lot of um uh, intellectual input so that if you're you're tired you can still direct your mind towards god through through the rosary um so that i think that might be a pretty good base for an anglican and then if you feel the need for more it's it's so 
litany uh, of Our Lady in the St. Augustine's prayer book and um, lots of, lots of uh, devotional opportunities in, in various books of devotion. I think that's a, I think that's a good baseline for people. It's accessible. Um, you know, things like the Marian antiphons are very accessible. Um, I, I try to encourage people to, you know, say the Angelus, um, uh, throughout the day, um, if it's the proper season. Oh, the Angelus, yeah, that excellent, um, as a way of marking time, marking the day. And it's very incarnational. Um, so it's the, the best Marian piety is, um, is piety that's also incarnational. The best Marian art is always art that, that shows our Lord and his mother together rather than stature just of Our Lady, I think. Um, so keeping, keeping that idea of, of uh, approaching Jesus through his mother. Um, or with his mother, uh, that's a very healthy thing. Well, Archbishop, uh, I think we can kind of uh, move into our favorite section of the podcast, which is uh, what we're into. Um, Archbishop, what are you into? I know the last time you were on, you gave a great answer, so looking forward to it. Yeah, I think we talked about cocktails. Um, I'm not. I'm not doing cocktails right now. Uh, partly because it's Lent, but I'm, I'm actually not doing cocktails now. Uh, even if it were Lent, we're not Lent. Uh, more just drinking wine. Um, <clears throat> my uh, my family's gradually been consolidating in North Georgia. More uh, four of the sibling, four of the five siblings are here now, and we um, we like. We've, we've played for many years on family vacations, uh, Mexican train dominoes as a kind of family activity. <clears throat> so I've been, I've been playing that a lot. Uh, played bridge last night. Um, the problem with being um, a single person with bridge is usually you've got couples who are playing bridge. You need four, so um, I don't get to play bridge as much as I'd like to do, do that. Um, I'm going on retreat next week, so I ought to tell you I'm really into prayer and, and um, penitence. <laughs> it's Lent. I, I am to some extent, but um, so I've told you about dominoes and bridge and red wine. Sounds great. <laughs> I just taught our four turning five-year-old son how to play dominoes. Not Mexican train, but just regular dominoes, and he loves it. In fact, we're going to go do that as soon as we're done recording. Oh, it's a great game. Great. You can talk, start them falling like Southeast Asian republics. <laughs> oh, so they that's said. Good. That's good. What you and Father Creighton? Well, I, um, in a similar way, I guess, I uh, should be into spiritual and uh, things that are good for me, but um, I've been playing a video game. <laughs> so okay. um, I'm, I'm into, uh, I think what a lot of people are into right now, if they like games, which is Hogwarts Legacy. Um, it's in the world of Harry Potter. Uh, which I did like um, those books. So you, they came out when I was, you know, right at the exact age to read them. So um, I've always liked them. But uh, the game is, it's really fun. It's a, it's like a role-playing game. So it's kind of a big open world and you can kind of explore and do all sorts of things. It's sort of relaxing. Um, it's really beautiful. Yeah. So lots of vistas and things. You can fly around on a broomstick and enjoy it. Uh, so it's been my de-stress. Okay. And if anybody has any issues with the fact that Father Creighton is into Harry Potter-related things, please direct your complaints to Bishop Chandler Holder-Jones. 
That's right. Not to me. Not to me. <laughs> That's my right. guy. That's right. <laughs> we can supply Archbishop Jones's address upon request. That's right. That's right. I, I read the first Harry Potter novel, and I decided Harry Potter. I thought he was an unpleasant little boy. Um, uh, That's fair because he's my least favorite character. Okay, there you go. Uh, I was disrespectful to a duck. Um, he's vengeful. Yeah, I was. I was never impressed with with Harry Potter. I thought he was sort of um, kind of a brat. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, there were other characters Absolutely. I found more interesting. No wonder they kept him under the stairs, right? <laughs> Father was. What are you into? Uh, well, I am into something spiritual. Uh, not to show off, but uh, Bernard of Clairvaux's sermons for Lent and Easter season. Uh, listener Austin, who who had that great question earlier, uh, posted it in the Discord, and I said, you know, I really should pick something out to read this season. So I I ordered a copy too, and have have worked through through it quite a bit. He uh, actually figured into my uh, my sermon this past Sunday for the first Sunday in Lent. So, um, yeah, there, I, I love Bernard, uh, listeners know we did our episode on, on his treatise on grace and free choice. Um, and that was a ton of fun, but as a preacher, I've always loved Bernard as song of songs and, um, and some of his other sermons, but th this, this set is really, really good. So I'm, I'm quite enjoying it. Bernard is interesting in that the, him or refers to him a lot and um nobody was mad at bernard of clairvaux there's an interesting uh, discussion of this in the in the introduction to the edition of on grace and free choice that we used because you're right they loved him luther loved him too and calvin and um but they also were critical of on grace and free choice ah uh, right I, I guess I but, can say uh, on a top Bernard, but I have um, listening to the whole. I'm listen. I'm going to listen to the whole of the City of God, the whole thing. I've read bits, but I've never just listened to or read the whole thing. And I'm doing that now, uh, particularly on drives, and uh, so. I don't know how edifying that is. That's pretty edifying, I think. In fact, listeners, as soon as you're done listening to this full episode, you should also go download an audio version of City of God, just as long as it doesn't interfere and you're listening to the podcast. LibriVox.org. You've got a you've got a pretty good uh, pretty good version. The problem is the guy reads too quickly, and he mm -hmm. says Platonist, Platonist, and uh, I want to angle him. It doesn't say Platon, which might actually be correct, but it doesn't say Platonist. Platonist. Well, Archbishop, we really appreciate you coming on today. Um, I think this was a great episode. I think our listeners will get a lot from it. Um, and so thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. You. my pleasure take care thanks for inviting me oh do you Absolutely. want to say one thing about your blog uh, uh listeners i we you've said it before and you posted in our facebook group which is awesome but um if listeners do want to read some of your writing where where can they find it oh golly uh look that look up that wikipedia article it's there's a it's the name is there i think it's called anglican it's anglican catholic theology and or Anglican Catholic liturgy and theology or something like that but look up and then put blog or look up Wikipedia look me up on Wikipedia and it should be there somewhere it it is Anglican Catholic liturgy and theology okay there there it is there it is and I and you enjoy know it's doing... good when the author forgets the title of it seriously I'm, I'm pretty untechy so Good. Well, 
yeah, I, I encourage everybody to go check check out Archbishop Haverland's blog. Uh, there's a lot there, so you can read for a good long time. And my last post mentions Father McElveen. Does it? Well, the one about altar wine. Oh, oh, because of <laughs> what? Yeah. My uh... because of how much of it you drink. No, no. <laughs> he asked the question. Um, you know, you start asking questions. Is sherry altar wine? Can sherry be valid just for altar wine? And and so these questions got asked by a couple priests to a couple bishops, and that led to my post. Yeah, there was a I, I, it was a couple months ago, I think, but I went on a deep dive of what was allowed and what was prohibited and what the alcohol content needed to be. Just things to be concerned about and nerd out about, I guess. And interesting to know, yeah, that genetically modified grapes are okay. And <laughs> right. You have to use red wine. Also, Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, you have to use red wine. And someone said, uh, one priest said that, you know, went into. And I thought, because I end up saying red or okay, strong or weak is okay, sweet or dry is okay. Where's the rigidity? There's nothing rigid about that. Those things are okay. Sherry's not okay. And you probably use them, shouldn't use kosher wine because it's artificially sweetened, also, typically. So, yep. Anyway, never mind. I'm ranting now. Well, Archbishop, we really appreciate it. Um, listeners, you can find us wherever you catch your podcasts. Um, we would like you, please, to like this video, subscribe to um, our YouTube channel, or follow us. Um, and if you are interested, again, we'll make another plug for joining the Communion of Patreon Saints. Uh, it's just five dollars a month and you get access to some interesting things um our discord and if we do any sort of special presentations you'll be uh sent an, sent an invite to that as well um archbishop haverland would you give us a blessing let us pray the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy ghost be upon you and remain with you always amen amen Bye-bye.